Minecraft is an enormous and expansive game, built on surprisingly simple mechanics. But the more you poke at it, the more complex things can become. If you need help understanding this deceitfully simple game, then you've come to the right place. I'm William Strife, and welcome to the Minecraft Guide. Grab your pick, equip your shovel, and ready your storage chests, because it's time to go mining in the nether. The nether's hot, burning landscape can be dangerous and inhospitable, but the rewards for making an expedition to the dimension are well worth it. Before digging through the underworld, though, there are a series of things to keep in mind due to the hazardous nature of the locale. First is how single block pockets of lava can be present at any level and location. This means whatever method of mining you use, you need to be careful not to stand too close to any block you're uncovering, lest you end up bathed in lava, a fate that's complicated by how you can't place water in the nether to put yourself out. The second thing to understand is how to keep track of your location via world coordinates, which helps you find the ore you dig for. In Minecraft, your position in the world is tracked by coordinates that represent the block space where your feet are, and the world height is the most important one when mining for ore. There are several ways to see your world height depending on which version of Minecraft you're playing. On the Java version for computer, you need only press F3 to get the debug overlay, where you'll find the coordinate data represented by X, Y, and Z on the left side of the screen. If you're on a Mac, you'll need to hold down Function and then press F3. For Bedrock and console users, though, you need to enable coordinates for each world in Options before you load up your game. Regardless of which version of Minecraft you play, the Y value represents the height of your feet, meaning if you want layer 22 to be the highest one you remove, you want the Y coordinate readout to say 21. Another thing worth explaining is what a chunk is. In Minecraft, the world is generated, written, stored, and loaded in 16 by 16 block sections that reach from bedrock to sky, called chunks. Knowing where the borders of these chunks are doesn't typically have any value, but when it comes to certain types of mining, one which we'll cover here in a bit, seeing the borders can be of great benefit. If you're on Java Edition for PC, you can actually see the chunk world borders by pressing F3 and G, which will greatly help with precision mining. On Bedrock for both console and desktop though, there's no way to turn on and off a visual representation of chunk borders. Anyway, no matter your method of mining, you'll be doing a lot of digging for at least one of the resources you can find in the underworld. On that note, let's finally get to the resources you want to find, how to spot them, and the most efficient ways to grab them. First off is glowstone, which is a fragile, light-emitting block found in all biomes that hangs from ceilings. Quite literally, it's the easiest to find, as all you need to do is look up when you explore. The block shatters no matter what tool you use on it, and breaks into between two and four pieces of glowstone dust, which is a special alchemy ingredient. However, you can also combine four glowstone dust to recreate the glowstone blocks, and those blocks in turn can be used to craft redstone lamps. Redstone lamps are essentially a redstone-controlled version of glowstone that emit the same amount of light. Now, if you're looking to achieve maximum efficiency when mining glowstone, there are two things to try and do when harvesting this fragile resource. It simply comes down to whether you need blocks or dust. In the case of blocks, you should always use a tool enchanted with silk touch to avoid potential resource loss. Note that a pick with silk touch is not necessary, just any tool with the enchantment will do. Meanwhile, if you need the dust, using a tool enchanted with fortune, preferably fortune 3, will be the most certain way to get 4 bits for the maximum payout. Whether or not you care enough to follow these last two tips is up to you, but they are worth being aware of. Now for the ores embedded in the landscape, starting with nether quartz. This white crystal evenly generates a netherrack across all biomes at a vertical height ranging from 10 to 117. It's quite frankly one of the easier resources to find. When broken with any pick, it drops crystals which have a series of uses in crafting redstone-related contraptions, like daylight sensors, observers, and comparators. But quartz crystals can also be combined with cobblestone to make diorite, 
and then quartz with diorite to make granite. Beyond that though, you can craft four nether quartz together to get a block of quartz, which is a clean white stone that can both be crafted or run through a stone cutter to create stairs, slabs, bricks, or a type of pillar called chiseled quartz. Meanwhile, if you smelt a quartz block, it becomes smooth quartz, which itself can be crafted or cut into slabs and stairs. Insofar as enchantments go for mining this resource, the only thing you really want to use here is fortune. Since quartz ore drops as a single crystal, and several crystals can make rather aesthetically pleasing blocks, it's worth it to dig the ore with a fortune 3 pick. The next resource you'll commonly find is nether gold ore. Now, this variation on the standard gold ore you find in the overworld is unique for how when broken down it cracks into between 2 and 6 gold nuggets. Just like quartz, it generates between the levels of 10 to 117, but much less frequently and in much smaller veins. Now, since this ore drops as nuggets, you may immediately think it's worth mining with a Fortune 3 pick. However, speaking in the strictest of mathematical terms, the best way to get the biggest reliable payout is with Silk Touch. This is because smelting the ore essentially guarantees 9 nuggets, as that's what it takes to make one ingot. Meanwhile, even with a Fortune 3 enchanted pick, you'll only end up with 9 nuggets or more, maybe 56% of the time, and the other 44% of the time, you'll come up short with less than 9. The short and simple of it is, just use Silk Touch if you really care about getting the most out of your nether gold ore. Now, the final resource to dig for is by far the most valued and most laborious to acquire, Ancient Debris. This long-forgotten material is used to create netherite, a metal stronger than diamond that does not burn in and floats on top of lava. Netherite equipment and tools are created by combining a single netherite ingot with existing diamond equipment at a smithing table. This may sound cheap, but that's far from the case. The reason being that you first smelt ancient debris into netherite scrap, and then combine four scrap and four gold ingots to craft one netherite ingot. That is a lot for a single ingot. But then there's the difficulty of even finding ancient debris. The material never generates touching open air, and can be embedded in netherrack, basalt, and blackstone. What's more, it only generates in extremely small veins of 1 to 3 blocks, meaning you have to be extra thorough when digging for it. Basically, if any amount of block is left covered, you run the risk of missing and leaving behind a single block vein of debris. That may sound like very little to miss, but only two veins of ancient debris attempt to generate per chunk. And that's just attempt, not guarantee. For all of these reasons, your best bet to find ancient debris is split between two methods. The slow, safe, and cheap option being shelf mining, and the fast, expensive, dangerous option being blast mining. We'll start with shelf mining, which is a style of digging that relies on clearing out a 32 by 32 block area that's two blocks tall, and the roof of one shelf serves as the floor of the next one above. The reason you want to dig like this is to make certain you clear out an entire chunk, as there's a minuscule amount of ancient debris that can spawn in each one. This is where being able to see the chunk borders we spoke of earlier is a major boon. With the borders displayed, you can precisely focus on one chunk at a time, but because it isn't easy to know where those borders lie on bedrock and console, the 32 by 32 area is the only way to know you've cleared out a full chunk. This technique is basically just casting a wide net. A side bonus of using this method though, you'll find plenty of golden quartz in the process. How deep you go is also critical. Ancient debris spawns most predictably between a height or Y value of 8 to 22. Strictly speaking, one ore vein generates in that low area of the map, while a second, smaller vein generates with a maximum height of pretty much the nether ceiling. For that reason, it's not really worth it to search for both veins of ancient debris that generate in each chunk, as the one on the lower level is just flat out easier to find. That's pretty much the gist of it though. Avoid the lava oceans, dig your way down to level 22, then excavate large rooms down to level 8, and keep doing it. This will result in you finding as much golden quartz as you'll need, and hopefully just enough scrap to make at least some netherite. 
It is labor intensive though, and you'll end up with tons of netherrack as a result. So now, let's look at the faster and more dangerous method, blast mining. Blast mining, being a more industrious method of digging, requires you first have a large supply of sand and gunpowder, the latter of which is most reliably dropped by creepers. For more information on how to farm the stuff, check the card up top or the description for a separate video. Anyways, TNT is special because when it goes off, the blocks it destroys drop as items you can pick up. Using this to your advantage, you need to go down to a vertical height of 15 a tricky thing to do since it's below lava oceans, and dig a long, two-block-tall tunnel. Now, once you feel you've dug long enough, you want to back out of the tunnel and place TNT with about four spaces between each one, but stop before you reach your exit point. The idea here is you're trying to chain TNT so it keeps going off after you explode the first one, resulting in a relatively even tunnel blasted out. This method clears a large area quickly, but you risk losing any blocks and resources that aren't ancient debris. The reason is you'll unavoidably uncover small lava pockets that will cascade out and burn up all blocks and items. This is actually the major hazard of blast mining in the nether, and one of the requisite things you'll have to do is plug up any lava you find in the process. That, and hope you don't run into the lava ocean, as that'll put a stop to any mining operation right quick. A side note to all of this is how ancient debris is blast-proof, and as already stated, floats in lava, which makes this entire mining process safe for your main spoils. That's the fast, dangerous, industrious, and quite frankly sloppy way to mine for all resources. It is worth mentioning, however, that as expensive and fast as this method is, it's still no guarantee you'll find much debris since it has such a low spawn rate. Mining in the nether is unquestionably a tedious process, and whether or not it's worth the effort to find the rarest materials is an important question to ask. If you do go looking though, learning how to keep yourself supplied in the inhospitable dimension is important. To that end, check out the biome guide to get a hold on the various natural resources you can find and how to use a lot of the dirt and rock you'll mine up while searching for the goods. Until next time, I'm William Strife, and this video was made possible through viewer donations at strife.solutions. If you want to see more guides like this, then please consider contributing so I can continue making them. Subscribing also helps, and you can also check me out on Twitch where you'll find my stream schedule. Links in the description. Anyways, thanks for watching and listening. I'm William Strife, and I'll see you later.